Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos and today we're going to jump right into the building behind me, the J.M. Raffle Company building. I'm here on Heath Street in South Baltimore, in way South Baltimore, um, almost down to the Hanover Street Bridge if you know where that is. Have to say a quick thanks to the folks at the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation, CHAP. This building is on the city's landmark list and they've done some wonderful research on it, so thanks so much. Um, if, okay, if I told you that the next five minutes we were going to talk about corrugated cardboard packaging products. I suspect that many of you, maybe almost all of you, would hit the uh, stop video button and go back to doing whatever you were doing. Um, but if I told you for the next five minutes we're going to talk about why the box of cereal that you ate from this morning was reasonably affordable and share a David and Goliath story where our hometown hero um, helps beat a, uh, an evil New York uh, national cartel, maybe you'll hang in there. I hope you do. All right, let's start with, uh, with uh, the cereal story, and we'll start with Jacob Raffle. He's here in Baltimore uh, right around the early 1900s um, in this building, this is his building, uh, making corrugated cardboard packaging. Before corrugated cardboard, things were shipped in wooden crates. Um, if you were a cannery on the harbor and you were shipping oysters, cans of oysters, out to, say, Cincinnati, you would pack up, say, 100 cans in a wooden crate, put it on a train, and off it would go. And wood was good because it was sturdy and uh, it was pretty easy to make wooden crates, so a lot of people could do it. But it was pretty bulky and heavy and over time got more expensive as we denuded the forests around American cities, including here in Baltimore, and had to go further for the wood. So the canneries and other folks were looking for a cheaper packaging alternative. And that came in 1871 when a, a gentleman named Jones in New York patented corrugated cardboard packaging. To be fair, the British had invented corrugated cardboard before that. Um, they used it as a, a stiffener for those tall black hats that the men wore, but they didn't think to make it into packaging, and Jones did. Um, for those of you who are uninitiated in corrugated cardboard, the difference between it and regular card cardboard, here's a little primer. Regular cardboard is single ply. It's the stuff you went to in grade school when you wanted to make a birthday card for your mom. Corrugated cardboard has three plies, three layers, two outside layers, and then a middle layer that's sort of ruffled or raffled or baffled, but it's got air pockets in it. And that made it good for a container because it was sturdy, it was light, um, um, it, the little air pockets provided some cushioning, so hopefully your cans of oysters didn't get too dinged up when they arrived in Cincinnati, and it was cheap, and it caught on. The early days, however, there was a problem. The Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, for whatever reason, had set the rate for shipping in corrugated uh, uh, paper higher than the rate for shipping the exact same product in, uh, in wooden crates. I guess the wooden crate folks had gotten to them. But in 1903, the, uh, our good friends at the cereal industry got an exemption so that cereal boxes could be packaged up in corrugated cardboard and sent at the same rate as if they were packaged in crates boxes. Ten years later, uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, dropped its uh, uh, higher tariffs and it leveled the playing field uh, for corrugated cardboard, but it was the cereal folks who got, broke through that barrier. So maybe tomorrow we can say a little thanks to our friends in Battle Creek, Michigan and elsewhere uh, for helping us on that count. All right, that's the cereal part. How about the David and Goliath part? Let's go back to our friend Jacob Raffle, our box maker here in Baltimore. Um, when the, the Interstate Commerce Commission leveled the playing field, the big box makers uh, got together and formed a cartel out of New York. And one of the things they did was try to block competition. And they did that by using their financial muscle to buy up all of the new patents that were coming out for new machines that made boxes. Um, and then not letting that technology get to any, uh, any non-cartel member. Um, and of course, who was not in the cartel? Uh, Raffle was not in the cartel. But he had an ally, a gentleman named Tobias, who was his brother, who lived in New York, who happened to be an inventor, and who happened to make machines uh, that went into the paper, the corrugated paper uh, making process. Tobias basically invented some of the same patents that the cartel held, including uh, one that was really coveted. It was some sort of um, uh, conveyor belt process that allowed the corrugated cardboard to really whiz through the manufacturing system and you can make a lot of it fast. And Tobias sold his machines to non-cartel members, to the little guys, including his brother here in Baltimore. Um, the cartel folks were hopping mad at that and decided litigation was the best strategy. They spent a decade trying to sue
sue uh, uh, Tobias and his brother out of business. Um, the plan basically backfired as in the process of all the filings in the court cases, uh, the secrets for the patents, especially that uh, conveyor belt patent, leaked out and inventors across the country uh, got a hold of it, maybe tweaked it a little bit and uh, got their own patents on new machines. So you can almost see the cartel folks hopping mad in the courtroom as they're winning case after case, but their secrets are leaking out to the general public and they're losing the bigger war. Um, but to, uh, here in Baltimore, uh, our raffle was doing quite well, so well that in 1920, uh, uh, he got bought out by the uh, nation's leading corrugated cardboard manufacturer, a group out of Sandusky, Ohio, um, and they were called the Hind and Dausch Company. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and they, after World War I, were uh, trying to set up regional offices, uh, regional manufacturing plants, and they were desperate to be here in Baltimore because of Procter & Gamble. Our manufacturing facility on the water was making a lot of soap products, packaging them up and shipping them across the country and indeed across the world. Um, and, uh, and the Sandusky folks didn't want Procter & Gamble to basically make their own, build their own box plant and cut them out. So they came here uh, and started making locally at a, at a cheap price and Procter & Gamble kept using them. Um, that worked out until the 1930s uh, when packaging changed and, uh, and the building was bought by the Hoshel Cohn Company, the department store downtown. We're right here by the railroad tracks and Hoshel Cohn used it as a warehouse. And in fact, they used it as a warehouse for a number of years. Um, and after they were gone, it continued as a warehouse um, until today it's been converted into apartments. And I will say, I think that the conversion was really successful. Um, they did a good job of keeping the industrial character here, including the signature water tank on the top that dates back to 1910 when the building was built as a corrugated cardboard box company. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.